My name is Kalpana Wilson, and I'm really happy to be part of this very important event. And I'm particularly excited to take part in the session on 16th August with so many brilliant activists and thinkers on colonial and racial historical legacies and their impact on feminist justice. So for this brief 10 minute talk, I'm going to focus on some of the overarching themes of the session and then go on to touch on some of my own work on reproductive justice. So when we think of gender, we need to start by looking at history and specifically the history of Atlantic slavery and colonialism. We need to remember that the very idea of gender has always been also racialized. The emergence of ideas of womanhood under capitalism were in fact inseparable from whiteness and enslaved racialized women were seen as outside of gender. As the decolonial feminist thinker Circes Mendes explains, gender was attached to a humanity that is racialized as European and white. And this meant that they could be subject to extreme forms of sexual violence and at the same time were considered capable of almost infinite amounts of labor. Now this critique of gender has been central to black feminism since its inception. It's there in Sojourner Truth's iconic speech from 1851 known as Ain't I a Woman? And of course it's elaborated in the seminal book by Bell Hooks of the same name. Now, in many parts of the world, the whole concept of gender as a way in which society is hierarchically organized was introduced by colonialism, as decolonial feminists like Lugones and Oyuwumi have argued. And even where gender was already present, colonial powers reshaped gender relations, intensifying women's subordination. Of course, this was intensely resisted by women, Many of us know the inspiring example of the Igbo Women's War of 1929 in what is now southeastern Nigeria. Thousands of women came together against the British colonialists uh, who were undermining women's sources of power and authority in Igbo society. And there are many other examples. For example, in Manipur, in northeastern India, there was the Nupilan, which also means women's war where women successfully resisted the destruction of the rice markets run by women and the forcible export of rice by the British colonialists. Now, when we talk about feminist justice, very often it is assumed in many different quarters that feminism is something inherently Western both imperialist interventions in the name of women's rights and those who hold patriarchal power within communities define these feminist ideas as Western. And of course, one of the things this does is to make multiple feminisms in different locations invisible. So just taking some examples which I know about from India, 2012 saw a spontaneous mass anti-rape movement emerge in Delhi on a scale which was unprecedented globally. It began as a protest against the horrific gang rape of a student in Delhi. But all kinds of questions came to be raised in this movement about spaces of gender violence as not only being the street, but also often the home, about the perpetrators as including family members and at the same time the state, the police, the army, but within India, we also have to recognize the many less celebrated protests against gendered violence by women from marginalized and oppressed communities. For example, the iconic 2004 naked protests by women elders in Manipur, who held a banner saying Indian army rape us, protesting the murder and rape of a young woman, Manorama, by Indian soldiers. And currently we're seeing the Dalit women activists who are exposing the epidemic of rapes of Dalit women and girls by dominant caste, powerful men. Now in 2020, 
India's Hindu supremacist government had introduced new Islamophobic laws which effectively exclude Muslims and Muslim women in particular from citizenship. And in response, we saw the inspiring Shaheen Bagh movement in which thousands of Muslim women courageously occupied public spaces in months long sit-in protests across the country. These women were not self-defined feminists, yet their actions and their thinking challenged the intersectionally gendered violence of the state. So when we speak of feminist justice, we need to recognize that in fact, there are many different understandings of what feminist justice requires. Now my work uh, focuses on international development and I understand international development interventions as essentially extending the plunder of resources and labor and lives for corporate profit, which was at the heart of racialized colonialism. Increasingly now, development is about intensifying women's labor for neoliberal global capital accumulation. Once again, we can see how women in low-income households in the global south are considered to have an almost infinitely elastic capacity for more labor. Except now, this is often reframed as resilience and entrepreneurialism. At the same time, these women's bodies are represented as excessively fertile in ways which are again deeply racialized. Population growth has long been represented as the cause of poverty, shifting responsibility from global capital. And today, women's fertility in the global south is blamed for not only poverty, but climate change, terrorism and migration. At the same time, Global population policies now use the language of reproductive rights and market-driven choices. I want to make very clear that women and all people who can become pregnant do have a need for access to a range of safe and effective contraceptives which they can control. But this will not happen when global institutions are setting targets for the numbers of women who must adopt particular contraceptive methods and brands, as we'll see. Now, the Gates Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is the most influential actor in this field. We've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, the role it's played in reinforcing and defending vaccine apartheid. Now, in 2012, the Gates Foundation, alongside the UK government, UNFPA and others, launched FP 2020, Family Planning 2020, aiming to get 120 million more girls and women in the poorest countries to use voluntary family planning by 2020. And this has now been extended and renamed FP 2030. In reality, the initiative sets targets for governments to get women to adopt specific injectable and implantable hormonal contraceptives. They include Depo-Provera, which feminist reproductive health activists has long identified as having a number of serious side effects and is requiring continuous medical follow-up, which is not available in the context of decimated health systems. These contraceptives are seen then as undermining users' health and their control over their bodies. But these contraceptives are claimed to have almost 100% effectiveness rates compared to other methods which users have more control over. And this is important to the Gates Foundation because Melinda Gates in particular is opposed to abortion. So these methods are seen as desirable because they potentially reduce demand for abortions, even at the expense of the health of those who use them. And we can see again here the racialized devaluing of certain women's lives. But these are not the only methods being promoted. The Indian government, for example, has long used sterilization of women as the main method of contraception. 
with mass sterilization camps in which women from oppressed and marginalized communities were coerced into undergoing the surgery, often under unsafe conditions. After India signed up to FP 2020, these abuses have intensified and deaths in sterilization camps have further escalated. In one example in 2014, 15 young women from oppressed caste and indigenous Adivasi communities died in a camp in the state of Chhattisgarh. Now policies of neo-Malthusian population control accompany those of corporate land grab. And this particular connection is especially stark in Chhattisgarh where this happened. This is a mineral rich region in which Adivasi or indigenous communities are resisting displacement and destruction by mining corporates. And women are at the forefront of this. And they're facing endemic rape and sexual violence by paramilitaries. Human rights activist Hidme Markham was abducted by the police at an International Women's Day event this year to protest the sexual torture and death in custody of two other Adivasi women. And she has since been accused under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, a draconian anti-terrorism law used to stifle dissent, and she's currently still in prison. Now, meanwhile, under the far-right Hindu supremacist regime of Narendra Modi, the incitement to gender violence against marginalized and demonized communities, particularly Muslims and Dalits, is central to the way power is reproduced. Claims about Hindus being outnumbered and of imaginary Muslim population growth and the need for population control are being articulated by politicians on a daily basis. This is the context in which those who advocate reproductive justice, a key aspect of feminist justice in India, are operating. For them, as for many others, feminist justice encompasses justice for those subject to the violence of racialized global population policies, to the violence of corporate dispossession, displacement, occupation, militarization, and borders, and justice for all those resisting the fascist regimes currently proliferating across the world. Thank you.